by the way. Great. Well, welcome everyone to the BQE um, February 17th. Uh, we have um, Alex Skolnick here. Uh, he's assistant professor at the Department of Statistics and Applied Probability at UC Santa Barbara, a research fellow at the Consortium for Data Analytics in Risk at, the, at UC Berkeley, where he was a, a postdoctoral scholar. Uh, he received his PhD in computational mathematics and engineering from Stanford University in 2015. Uh, his research interests include Monte Carlo simulation, high dimensional statistics and quantitative financial risk management. Uh, let's please welcome Alex Skolnick. And I'm going to ask um, if anyone has any questions. Uh, he's asked, he's invited us to go ahead and ask those during the presentation. Of course, if they become overwhelming, he reserves the right to postpone those to the end. So um, I'm really excited about this talk. Uh, let's get started and uh, look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks very much, David. Um, and thank you for the invitation. Wish I could be there uh, in person with everyone, but um, otherwise, this will, this will have to do. Um, Hope you enjoy the talk. This is work that's sort of uh, very dear to me. There's a number of collaborators uh, that I work with on this topic that are actually on the call. Um, uh, so maybe they can uh, correct me as I go if I make any mistakes, but uh, otherwise, you know, the talk is titled James Stein Estimation of Minimum Variance Portfolios. And uh, here I go. I am trying a new setup of this uh, talk where I'm on my iPad. And so you'll see kind of uh, this sliding that hopefully will work for us. and. Um, Hope you have patience uh, with me as I get adjusted to this kind of new way of, of giving talks. Uh, this is just a list of uh, not only related work, but uh, work that um, I'm involved with and my collaborators are involved with. Uh, I'm trying to go for kind of a survey talk here. And so what you see on top there are uh, four um, uh, papers that are, are very related to the themes of this talk. I'll try to cover uh, some results from a number of them. There's also. You went on mute accidentally. Okay, sorry. Was this the whole time or? or um, no, no, just the last sentence. Just the last sentence, okay. Yeah, I still see it, admit the uh, screens coming in, okay. Um, we'll, 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 admit, we'll, we'll admit people, don't worry about that. Okay, all right, sounds good. So um, in addition to some of these papers uh, I'm covering, there's also uh, exciting work in progress that I'll try to mention towards uh, the end. Um, hopefully, we can attract new collaborators to this um, uh, to this topic, which we're all very excited about. Just to mention a few of my collaborators here that are on this uh, on these slides, and also in the uh, participants list, it's Lisa Goldberg, Alec Kercheval, who Babe Gorgadon. Um, I think one of my students, Yu Hong Lee, is here, hopefully. Um, I lost track of the participant, participants list at this point. Um, hopefully, you're there, Yu Hong. And with that, uh, let me keep going. This is a kind of a large table of contents. And what this represents to me is kind of a few sort of chapters or short stories. I try to make these uh, have exciting titles. Uh, hopefully, you'll like them, and hopefully, I can weave them all together in a coherent way and so that you get as much out of it um, uh, as possible. So uh, with that in mind, here, here I go. This is the first uh, kind of section on Markowitz's optimization enigma for minimum variance portfolios. And my first slide on this should be familiar to, to most folks here. That's the Markowitz bullet, which um, where we see the efficient frontier. So these points here are portfolios um, pictured in terms of their trade-off of mean and risk. Um, but the kind of very specific uh, point or portfolio that I wanna focus on is this one right here, it's the minimum variance portfolio. So kind of a pessimistic outlook of this is that we've been able to partially solve or address uh, one point out of infinitely many. Um, and so uh, the kind of talk will focus on this one point in particular and the reference to the Markowitz optimization enigma comes from this paper from Richard Michaud in 1989. Um, so this is not maybe not the most common kind of term, but I've seen it used in the literature. What this refers to is the fact that when you use uh, data, so uh, sampled data, uh, and in this case, it's gonna be on uh, returns to securities, you never have access to the covariance structure of the actual return. So for me, sigma is gonna to refer to the true covariance matrix, which we don't have access to. And when you don't have access to, you estimate. Uh, and what this results, it's gonna result in, in some other curve being drawn here. 
Um, so I don't know how far away it's going to be. Uh, it's kind of well known that it's difficult to generate uh, this curve with estimated data. And so the Markowitz optimization enigma refers to this phenomenon. And I'm going to in particular focus on, like I said, this point, the minimum variance point, and say something about uh, its cousin, right? The one that's estimated with uh, data. So this is the particular form of the quadratic program that I'm going to discuss. This is the way to compute a minimum variance portfolio where you're solving a quadratic optimization problem. Uh, this line here represents the variance of your portfolio and the only constraint involved is called the fully invested constraint. Uh, in other words, all my investment positions, which are in my portfolio X sum to one, the solution of this is going to be called W hat right here. Um, and E is the vector of all ones. And again, we recall that this um, uh, object here is estimated. And the reason it's estimated is because we don't have access to the true covariance matrix. The next uh, item on the agenda is something called the spiked uh, covariance model. So this is terminology coming out of statistics. And there's a lot of work on this in the field of random matrix theory. Uh, the way I'm going to present it here um, is in a decomposition that looks like this. So I'm decomposing the covariance matrix into two components. One of them is this positive definite matrix gamma. Um, I'm going to assume that the eigenvalues of gamma are bounded in P. So P is my dimension or the number of securities. And the assumption here in the spike model, um, which, is which, which is trying to separate out um, this component here, which is called the spike or referred to as the spike, uh, to separate it out from this other component gamma. Uh, and this should be a little bit familiar from, for those coming from finance, where you're decomposing the covariance in terms of systematic risk and specific risk. So in some ways, you could think of gamma as corresponding to the specific risk um, inherent in my security uh, securities, and beta, uh, this outer product of the vector beta uh, to the systematic risk. And so the one assumption in the spike model is that this quantity, the inner product of beta with itself, which is just the sum of the values squared, grows linearly with the dimension or linearly with the number of securities. This is what um, the spike really refers to. Um, I stole this image here from a paper by Potters, Bouchard, and Lelou. Uh, this is, uh, from what I understand, S&P 500 data. And the reason I'm showing this here uh, is that this is capturing very well this decomposition. This uh, small caption here that's zooming in on this uh, dot, this is the spike. The rest of this area here, and by the way, this is a plot of the empirical eigenvalues of data obtained from the S&P 500. Um, this component refers to my gamma from the previous slide. And this beta, or in particular, this eigenvalue, uh, the largest eigenvalue of this matrix, refers to the market here. So the variance of the risk uh, corresponding to the market. Uh, and this is a typical plot that you see um, in random matrix theory analyses where um, this, uh, this plot here is actually the marchenko pasteur distribution, uh, the distribution of eigenvalues after the spike has been removed. Um, so hopefully, and, and this is something that you see in financial data over and over again, um, and hence the adopted model uh, in this work. I'm going to simplify things a little bit more uh, and give gamma this structure here, a scalar times an identity. So this is simplifying the structure of my covariance matrix um, uh, a little bit further. Uh, and the other thing I'm going to uh, write um, the covariance matrix as um, I'm going to write it in terms of the population principle component. So that's going to be denoted by B. Um, and um, what you see here is, uh, you know, the way to read this, uh, this decomposition is that B is the, eigen, the population eigenvector with the largest eigenvalue. That eigenvalue is given by sigma squared. Um, and all the other eigenvalues are small. So those are going to be my deltas. And you can see here that the eigenvalues of gamma those are just the delta squares. Those are indeed bounded uh, in P. So what I've done here 
uh, corresponds to my earlier set of assumptions. Uh, when it comes to estimating the covariance matrix, um, this is going to be the corresponding decomposition where uh, the sigma hat, the estimated covariance, uh, is made up of uh, another spike eta. This is an estimated uh, vector. Um, and uh, gamma hat. And now I'm going to assume the same structure where you have delta hat estimating the um, estimating, of course, delta squared and um, sigma hat estimating sigma p squared. And h is going to be the sample principal component. So uh, off we go, I have new variables here. Uh, these are normalized now to the unit sphere. And let's see what I have next. I have an illustration of the Markowitz enigma in terms of these uh, quantities. So the first thing I'm gonna do is compute uh, an estimated minimum variance portfolio, which uses this sigma hat uh, uh, estimate. And I'm gonna recognize that the true variance of this portfolio is given by this expression here. So you can see that what I'm, what's being used in the middle here is the true covariance, which you know another way to think about this quantity is an expected out of sample variance of my portfolio. Um, the sharp asymptotics of this quantity are given in this work here that I mentioned at, at the introduction. Those are actually derived in appendix B of that paper. And this notation here is essentially saying that we're a constant off from this quantity, which I'm going to define and talk about in a second, um, in a certain limit. So the limit that I'm going to talk about is when the portfolio becomes large, the number of securities grows to infinity. And this quantity E uh, of H uh, is something that we call the optimization bias. The important thing to kind of to, to note here is that the eigenvalue estimates, which are typically the focus of uh, estimation problems in statistics and random matrix theory literature, uh, those um, vanish in this asymptotic. In other words, the true variance of my portfolio doesn't depend on how well I estimate this part of the model. Uh, what we'll see is that the dependence solely resides in this uh, sample eigenvector H, so if I scroll back here, this is my decomposition for um, my estimated covariance. And this term right here, which is the leading eigenvector of my estimated covariance matrix, fully determines the expression for uh, the true variance of my portfolio. The next slide tries to connect this to uh, the estimated variance of the portfolio. So you can see the definition here and the way it, it differs from the previous one is that now I've plugged in my estimated uh, covariance matrix in the middle. And now you see a whole different asymptotic. This is saying that the estimated variance of my portfolio decays as the number of securities grows to infinity and it decays down, down to zero. And so you can right away spot a substantial problem, namely that the ratio, the ratio of the true risk for the true variance of my portfolio to the estimated variance diverges as the number of securities uh, increases. And you can see the constants that are missing here, uh, constant for this one and the constant in front of what we call the optimization bias. Those can be found in the, in the appendix of this paper. Um, and so, um, you know, this is another way of, of um, I guess, mathematically characterizing the Markowitz enigma, the statement that estimation error is going to enter in into your portfolio in a funny way that's going to give you a very big diverging gap between the true risk and the estimated risk. So what's this, um, the optimization bias that I've been, um, uh, that I've been discussing? Uh, it's given by this expression. So the first thing I need to do uh, to define it is to talk a little bit about this vector Z, which is the unique dispersionless vector on the unit sphere. So all you do to obtain it is you take the vector one, which actually comes from the constraint of the Markowitz uh, program that we computed the minimum variance with um, and normalize it by 
by square root of p. So this is going to normalize that vector down to the unit sphere. And now the optimization bias is just uh, a collection of inner products. So this is uh, what I mean. Uh, and this expression depends on three quantities. This constant fixed dispersionless vector z, my uh, estimate h, and my true vector or true population component uh, b. Sorry, give me a sec. Okay. And one final comment. Again, this error doesn't depend on the eigenvalues uh, nor their estimates. So what do I mean by more than one way to, to shear a sheep? Um, what we're going to be trying to do is deal with um, this asymptotic or unfavorable asymptotic. Um, as you look at this, ideally, you would like this term to be small. And so what I'm about to discuss is ways to set the optimization bias to zero. Um, I don't know why this uh, graphic is a little bit ruined here. Uh, hopefully the others are, are gonna be okay. Um, I don't know if there's a way to refresh this. So this is the expression I care about. I'd like to set it to zero, meaning supply a different argument, a different estimate um, to reduce my ratio between estimated and true risk. And this is what geometrically my, the whole situation looks like. We have some unknown vector B. This corresponds to the spike of the population covariance. We have some uh, estimate. So this is the eigenvector of the estimated covariance matrix. And it lies somewhere else uh, on the sphere. And then we have this vector Z, um, which is the unique dispersionless vector. By dispersion, um, I'm really discussing the variation in the entries of a vector. And so if we scroll back up to the definition, because all the entries here are flat, all the same, uh, I'm referring to it as dispersionless. Now, as you move away from Z, just like these two vectors are, you pick up more variation in the entries. So there are a number of ways to, um, to try to set this to zero. And so, you know, one could see, one could ask if the vector z does it. This is actually the first thing we've tried, which is why I'm suggesting it, just to point out the mistake that we made um, initially. Um, if you do substitute um, h equals z in this numerator, you do pick up a zero, but then the zero also ends up in the denominator. And so this clearly is not going to work very well. So that's the wrong answer. There is um, a right answer which is just a population component. So the true vector B, which we don't know, but if you actually substitute um, B for H uh, in this formula here, uh, you'll see that it equals out to zero as one would expect. So the error, if we actually fix the error uh, in our estimation of B, uh, we're gonna do a good job estimating the minimum variance portfolio. What's the, the issue with this? It requires obviously a consistent estimator, something that converges very quickly. Um, we're gonna be uh, in a few minutes or so in a setting of uh, a finite sample. And so you have error involved. And so to estimate this consistently and in a way that has you know, a rapid convergence is potentially uh, tricky to do. And so what I'm gonna propose to you is, um, is another right answer. So it turns out that there are multiple um, places on the unit sphere where you could try to zero out this quantity. And here's one of them. So what's, what's happening here? I'm gonna be taking a linear combination of my raw estimate, H, um, and the dispersionless vector Z. And I'm gonna put, in, I'm gonna put them together using this parameter. So this is a, kind of a parametric family of estimators. And whatever t you, you give it, that's the estimator you, you get. Um, and here's an illustration. So as t moves, um, let me actually check, I don't remember anymore. Uh, as t moves up, we're gonna be moving towards z. So as my t becomes larger, uh, I move this way. And when I set t equals to zero, hopefully as we can verify from the previous formula, I just recover my h again. So right here, uh, t would be equal to zero. Uh, so why is uh, the optimization bias 
zero uh, somewhere on uh, this arc. I'm going to explain this uh, in a second. Um, so th this is actually the giving you one of the the, the roots uh, of this equation. So if you go ahead and plug in um, or set up this equation, directly setting the optimization bias to zero for some parameter t, and then solving for the parameter t, uh, you will obtain this specific uh, quantity here. And so plugging in this value for the parameter eliminates all the optimization bias. Um, and the question is going to be concerning these unknown quantities. So we don't know the vector b. And so you can see that this part of the formula, we don't know. Uh, this part of the formula, we don't know. And we don't know this part uh, of the formula either. Oh, and this one. So there are a lot of unknowns. But at least we can comfort ourselves with the fact that this value does exist. And here's, um, hopefully I have an interpretation of it somewhere here. There it is. Um, so there's a nice way to, uh, to show this. You can do kind of a lot of algebra, or you can take something called the law of spherical cosines, which identifies the left-hand side here with this quantity. And I'll talk about, I think we can ignore this for, for a bit. So these are signs of various angles or arc lengths, which maybe I can discuss them in a second. More important angle is this one, this big theta or the cosine of it. And this is the angle between these two arcs. So I'll illustrate this on the next picture um, in a second. Uh, there it is. And your intuition should tell you right away that if you set that angle to 90 degrees, your cosine will go to zero and so will the optimization bias. So that's gonna be our kind of rule of thumb or intuition for how to, um, for how to set the right point. And here's what the right point looks like. So this is the estimator that we would like uh, to get to. And obviously there are a number of caveats. One of them is that this parameter tau star uh, depends on uh, quite a few unknown things, at least at this point. So um, I'll mention that there are not just potentially, but definitely are other places to look for. Uh, we haven't done that. And so that could be some potential for future work is to identify other points where the optimization bias goes to zero. But for now, we're working within this parametric family that I've called HT. And we're going to try to hunt down the value of this parameter uh, in particular in a certain estimation setting. We're going to be talking about principal component analysis uh, in a minute. Um, and so that's specifically the setting in which we're going to have to estimate all of these um, little projections here. Okay, let me ask if there are any questions so far on sort of some of the, the visuals and the, the illustration and the intuition for what, um, for what I'm doing. If not, let me keep going. Um, I'm going to talk about optimization bias free PCA. So we're now in a PCA setting. We're going to ask whether we can actually um, develop that estimator that I just sketched out. So the details of this um, setup can be found um, uh, in our paper called dispersion bias. And what I'll do instead of getting into the, the kind of the extreme level of detail, I'll give you kind of a rough sketch of what model we use. It's a simple stylized model for returns. Um, I'll also sketch out roughly what the assumptions are and give you a sketch of the theorems. Um, and the reason I'm going over this pretty quickly is because I'd like to get to the James Stein part uh, of the talk, which was uh, obviously in the title. This is going to be a linear model for our returns. Uh, in other words, y is a vector in RP. Um, and so each entry is going to be the return of, of um, every one of the securities. Uh, the securities are correlated through a parameter beta, which we earlier saw as something that defines the spike in the covariance structure of the matrix. And Z is the specific return, uh, which relates to the gamma in the decomposition. So the decomposition I had looked something like this. And so this part right here of the covariance matrix um, refers to this uh, part of the return, and the gamma refers to this residual here, this error. 
Uh, both of the variables are latent. So this is going to be motivating the use of PCA. So in other words, we don't observe uh, any of the factor returns. We don't observe the factor return X. We obviously don't observe the error residual Z. All we have are N observations of our securities, and we're going to pack those into a data matrix. So what's given to us and kind of a um, quick description of the problem, um, it will be given a P by N data matrix, uh, which I'm going to call Y. So written in a slightly different font there. Uh, the columns of this matrix are derived from N observations of this vector coming from my model. So this is the P dimensional returns vector. Um, I'm going to put up some assumptions under which the covariance matrix is going to be of the right uh, kind. And the goal will be to get to a zero optimization bias once we've estimated this true covariance matrix. Uh, here is a brief description of some of the assumptions. Uh, one of them concerns the covariance structure between the factor return X and the residual return Z. So in a factor model, these are typically assumed to be uncorrelated, which is what that statement says. Uh, we want the factor return to be non-zero. In other words, we need something to be generating a correlation amongst uh, all of the securities. There are some regularity conditions on beta, which I'm gonna skip for the sake of time, uh, but these roughly refer to the average and the sample variance or variation of the entries of beta converging. And when I talk about convergence, I'm talking about a large portfolio, so the dimension P is growing. Uh, and lastly, this part is, the, uh, the non-spike component of my covariance. So this is saying that my securities are uncorrelated. They have variance equal to delta squared. Uh, and then there are some additional um, uh, assumptions of independence and lack of correlation over time. So you can check out the specific or the kind of the, the very rigorous statements um, in the paper, but uh, uh, hopefully you can see some of the intuition as to why these um, correspond to a spike covariance model. Uh, this assumption in particular is what guarantees that. So with some of these assumptions in place, what happens with uh, the data matrix? Well, what we're going to do is the, um, the obvious thing. We're going to take our data. We're going to form a sample covariance matrix by taking this outer product. And then we're going to extract our estimates. So now I'm actually giving a specific form uh, to what this estimate is. Uh, it is the first sample principal component uh, given the data defined as the eigenvector of the sample covariance with the largest sample eigenvalue. So this S curly S squared is the largest value um, in, uh, uh, in my data set. It corresponds to the direction of maximal variance and um, there is a lot of literature devoted to the study of asymptotics um, and there's different kinds of asymptotics uh, in terms of how P and N, the number of observations and the number of securities or number of variables relate to one another. Um, but um, what I will say at this point is that within this uh, literature, uh, most of the attention has been, pay has been paid to eigenvalues and their convergence. Um, um, that said, there is also literature on the asymptotic behavior of sample eigenvectors. Uh, one question has been um, the correction for biases. So while the literature on asymptotic for eigenvalues directly points to how we correct bias in eigenvalues, um, there is, well, uh, I guess in the, in the standard R&T framework, it becomes much more difficult to understand how we correct um, the eigenvector estimates. So while we, we have a good theory for correcting eigenvalue estimates, um, we don't see as much of that for the correction of eigenvectors. Now, I pulled the following, following quote from a fairly recent paper talking about um, how various parts of the eigenvector in terms of a, a certain uh, coordinate transformation intertwine in a way um, that correction for biases in the estimation of the eigenvectors is almost uh, impossible. Um, so this is um, kind of the task. And one thing that's going to make um, 
the, the task of actually overcoming this difficulty a, a little bit simpler uh, is the regime that we adopt. I already mentioned this asymptotic where the number of variables or the number of securities grows with P. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna fix the sample size. And this is gonna make the mathematics a little bit simpler. And it's also going to make the bias in the eigenvectors uh, be a little bit more transparent. So this is one of the uh, images uh, that we have from the dispersion bias paper that I referenced earlier. Um, and this uh, essentially is a statement that characterizes bias in PCA estimates of population uh, eigenvectors. This is my population principal component. This is my sample principal component. And if you open up that paper, you'll see uh, a theorem, a theoretical statement that says that with high probability, uh, this angle here, which is the angle between my sample component and the vector z, also the length of this arc here, is with high probability larger than the arc length from the population component to z. And so what right away immediately pops out from this image is this area that's shaded, which is what we call the PCA or the dispersion bias associated with principal component analysis. Um, and you can see how the, the geometry of the estimator that I sketched out earlier is gonna play favorably with this. We're gonna aim to move this uh, estimate upwards. So here's a very quick recipe for how to do this. Um, uh, what we operate with are eigenvalues of our sample covariance. And so we'll take the largest one, that's this S squared here. We'll also look at the average of the remaining non-zero eigenvalues. That's gonna be this quantity uh, L squared P. And we're gonna define this eigenvalue gap. So this psi variable, oh, second. This psi variable um, is capturing the gap between what you could think of as the noise in the system. That's this uh, average of the remaining non-spiked eigenvalues and the eigenvalue corresponding to the, to the spike, the S squared. Uh, given this estimate, and there's actually a nice theorem for, for uh, how you can estimate the angle between the population and the sample principal component in terms of the psi, uh, I'm gonna skip this. I'm gonna skip ahead right to, the, to this recipe here, which gives you a data-driven parameter called tau p. And you'll notice this is computed entirely from data. We'll see the sample principal component here and this quantity psi, which is computed entirely from eigenvalues of the sample covariance matrix. And once you have it, uh, you can go ahead and um, uh, assemble this estimator. It's the one that I motivated geometrically just a little while ago. And here is the main, uh, main theorem um, under the assumptions that I presented or loosely paraphrased. The optimization bias of this new estimator specifically with that value of tau goes to zero. And in contrast, if you were to replace uh, this, this estimator with the raw PCA counterpart, the H, you won't have that. In other words, the optimization bias stays almost surely bounded away from zero. And so the thing I'll sketch out here is uh, this ratio again, this right here, where, was the asymptotics for my minimum variance portfolio ratio in terms of the true risk and the estimated risk. And so here I'm plugging in the raw PCA estimate and you can see that this one will behave quite a bit better. We actually have a conjecture of what happens when you multiply this by P. Let me show you the conjecture. Uh, so this is not uh, a fully proved uh, result, but we feel fairly strongly about it. So this would be the boundedness of, oh, hold on, there's a typo. I need, to, uh, I need to replace this with the actual estimator. So in fact, I can write that this quantity here, if I use the raw PCA estimate, this will go up to infinity. So this will 
go up to infinity as p goes up to infinity, while um, we are going to claim that it remains bounded um, uh, when you actually correct um, or when you use the, the estimator that I showed you just a second ago. Here is a little bit of numerical evidence to this um, fact. So this is from, from the same paper where we're plotting the corrected estimator and the optimization bias scaled by the square root of p. So above here, I was scaling by p and, and squaring the optimization bias. In this picture, we're looking at square root of p times the optimization bias and looking at um, a distribution of this variable as the portfolio size grows. So you can see the kind of the um, numerical at least evidence for, for that conjecture. And here is the picture that confirms um, if you plug in PCA here. So this is the picture for the raw PCA estimate, this one right here, uh, this quantity grows. And this is for a Gaussian model um, of return. So the, you know, these entries beta that I've been now mentioning, um, one way to think about them is PCA betas that are proxy for market betas that are estimated uh, to gauge the risk of any individual security. And uh, what we just provided is an adjustment um, specifically for principal component analysis or for the very uh, leading uh, principal component uh, vector that is tuned to a minimum variance portfolio. And it's a kind of remarkable fact that the theory works even for two observations, as long as we take the number of securities up to infinity. There's a, a recent paper that actually shows that it, it is possible under some mild information uh, to get a consistent estimator. So in other words, um, H tau does not tend to be um, in the in this recent result by Alec and Hubei, boy, I think are on the call. Um, they're saying that under some mild information provided by uh, potentially by data, we could design an estimator called MAPS that turns out to actually be consistent. Um, so I cited that as a, as a reference and it's a very impressive result because even again, I think it's with two observations, you can potentially get consistency uh, with just a little bit of information about the true vector. Um, so this um, brings up kind of a history that connects this work to, um, to a lot of that has been done previously and, and namely it relates to uh, what are called beta adjustments uh, in the financial industry. So here I have a plot from um, another one of our papers called Better Betas. And this is showing us the dispersion or variation in market betas, or actually in here, I believe it's borrow predicted beta. So these are betas coming out of the borrow model for the S&P 500, and they're plotted over time. This red curve corresponds to their average value. So that's the curve that I'm tracing out. And the band around it corresponds to their variation, standard deviation or dispersion related quantities. Um, and what I'm going to suggest is that the estimator that uh, we just discussed is shrinking the dispersion or shrinking this band uh, to obtain uh, a better estimator. And this has a precedent. So this is a, an image from the Bloomberg uh, terminal. What you're looking at is a regression of, um, of a stock beta. So we're looking at the regression on the S&P 500. Uh, the stock in question here is uh, Exxon. Uh, and what you see here is first a regression result for a raw beta of 0 0.5. Uh, seven, nine, and then something called the adjusted beta. So that's the one I'm circling here. And you can see how it's computed. It's a linear combination. And in fact, I have the formula right below. This is the formula for adjusting betas where we're going to take a parameter C. In this case, uh, you can see that C is actually equal to two thirds. Um, and we're applying this transformation to the raw regression estimate. Uh, so that's exactly how this is computed. And my goal in the remainder of the talk will actually 
is to show you that what we did for the PCA estimator is essentially the same thing, uh, except that we didn't use two thirds necessarily. So you, you can the, read- That's the Bloom correction. And I, th I think the two thirds was an empirical uh, <clears throat> number. This goes yeah. back a long time. It, it, it's Marshall Bloom wrote it. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's in the 75 and actually 71 papers where it comes from. And the, the two thirds is actually a, a, something that's derived from a data set from 19, I think, 39 to 60, oh. something like this. Yeah. And it's been used ever since. Yeah. So you're, you're exactly right about that. Um, and, and the period, I don't know what the value is now, uh, if you were to rerun the results, but uh, this particular value of two thirds is based on data uh, for uh, 39 to, to the year 69. Um, yeah, so you can read a little bit about some of the, the history. Um, you mentioned Bloom's rule. Uh, it's the one that appears on the CFA exam. Um, uh, also closely related is the Vasichuk adjustment, which is actually using a dynamically estimated uh, C. Uh, and we also discuss in this paper the, the James Stein estimator and some of the literature surrounding the use of the James Stein estimator for this purpose in the setting of regression. And what I want to do in the rest of the talk is connect it to, to some of the PCA results that I showed you. Okay, so um, I'll talk a little bit about the Stein paradox. Um, see, I'm 20 minutes left. Is that about right? Maybe less, right? Um, oh, that's right. Okay. So let me briefly discuss the, the Stein paradox, and then I'll try to connect all of these ideas together. There's a picture of Charles Stein. I have a link here to, to a nice article about him, passed away in 2017. And this was a, was a nicely written article about some of his work and, and um, his activities with, within uh, academia and, and outside of it. Um, but what is the, the Stein paradox? It's, um, it is a statement that refers to the estimation of uh, a vector. Um, and what it's saying is that if you're going to go ahead and estimate uh, a sample mean um, or several sample means, if you're estimating more than two of them, um, the sample mean may not be the, the optimal estimator for that purpose. And I'll show you an example in a second. There is a, a large literature on this topic. Uh, I cannot possibly list, list all of it here. I've listed a number of uh, great textbooks here, uh, a few articles. Um, I hope I haven't omitted anyone's favorite one. Uh, so this is just a very small sampling uh, of the literature. Uh, let me very briefly talk about the, the paradox part of the paradox. I think it was summed up well by Stigler in 1990. So I'll read this quote from directly from that paper. When this phenomenon, speaking about the paradox, is first encountered, it can seem preposterous. The question is, how can information about the price of apples in Washington and about the price of oranges in Florida be used to improve an estimate of the price of French wine when it is assumed that they're unrelated? So the sample estimates in question here are the prices. So one of the sample estimates is the uh, price of apples. The other one's the price of oranges. And the, the paradox part refers to if you were just to estimate the price of apples with their sample mean and the price of oranges with their sample mean, you're still in dimension two, you have two quantities, and there's no paradox, you're using the right estimator. Once you add the, uh, the price of French wine, you have three things that you're estimating. And estimating those and taking, uh, uh, but you have to kind of use the right error metric, but here the error metric is mean squared error. If you're using mean squared error to judge uh, uh, your kind of estimator risk, um, then once you add French wine, the estimator all of a sudden becomes suboptimal. So hence the, uh, the, um, hence the paradox and the mystery. Uh, I put in a paper that's currently in progress by collaborators Lisa and Alec are on the call. They're writing about this in connection to, uh, to PCA and are discussing some of this, especially the Galtonian perspective. Um, let me try to kind of motivate what the a solution to the paradoxes or an estimator that achieves um, the lower risk, right? An estimator that we now need an estimator better than the one that uses just sample means. And a quick derivation of this comes from Efron Morris in, in 75, who are using fully Gaussian, a uh, fully Bayesian uh, type of derivation. So we're going to look at a vector eta right here, which we're going to assume to be distributed, uh, normally distributed with uncorrelated errors and a mean of theta. So theta is an unknown that's being uh, estimated. You can think of every single entry 
in the vector eta as a sample mean. And the more measurements you take, the smaller this, um, the, the variance here on the error becomes. And if you assume a Gaussian prior for the unknown, and you have the well-known conditional normal uh, formula for what do we expect the unknown to be given our observation. And the formula has the following shape from which you can quickly uh, infer this formula here, which I sh will show you in a minute, will look exactly like a beta adjustment. But just to read this off, the M here is the expected value of beta. The C is this quantity here. And the rest are just the difference between uh, eta and M. So M here, uh, I'm thinking of as an arbitrary vector, perhaps estimating this expected value, perhaps not. But what is this doing and why is it called shrinkage? Well, what it's doing is it's first subtracting out the mean. So this vector M, so you actually have that interpretation of being the mean. You're subtracting out the mean from your estimate. You're then going to shrink the variation around the mean uh, to be lower. C is between zero and one. So you're reducing the variation in the entries of eta. And then you're recovering or restoring uh, the mean back to what it was supposed to be. Um, but that, hence the name shrinkage formula. And there are some nice results that, that go with this that I'll quickly uh, describe. Um, if you start um, taking some of the sample and using it um, um, uh, and plugging in sample estimates for the theoretically optimal value of C, you'll see something that looks, so you'll get something that looks like this. Uh, I've shaded out the P because if we think about high dimension, this quantity P2 over P will go to one, but for the results um, related to the James Stein estimator, uh, there is this critical dimension after which things start to magically work. And for any fixed, um, it's called the shrinkage target M, uh, you can get the following result. This is saying that the mean squared error of the, the estimator A to C, the one that uses a shrinkage parameter C uh, up above, this one, uh, that mean squared error is strictly greater than the one in the original um, estimator. And this is by direct calculation from, from Efron Morris. Uh, you'll notice that the this new here, um, which is the variance of the the entries of my observations um, were assumed to be known, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, those could actually be estimated from data as well. Uh, and the results be become a little bit, um, slightly weaker, but uh, roughly take the following, the same, uh, the same shape. If I take M to be the vector of ones, and this is actually related to my fully invested portfolio constraint, which we'll come back to, uh, you'll get that the shrinkage formula looks like this which recovers our beta adjustment. Um, and in the original James Stein result in the 1961 paper by James and Stein, the target was actually zero, giving us uh, the shrinkage formula C times eta. So what, um, so what about the paradox? There, there is a way to kind of look at it and so that in a way that it, um, the paradox is almost transparent, or at least I'm mimicking some of the words from, from the paper by Stigler. Um, so this is the way I'm, I make sense of it. Um, there's all sorts of different presentations of the, the James Stein estimator and why uh, the shrinkage formula works. Now, here's kind of my uh, explanation of the way I like to think about it, which is if we think of our observation eta as being decomposed um, as a sum, so the, you know, our observation is based on the unknown, perturbed by some additive mean zero error W. If we write it this way, then um, some then a, a deviation W, an error W that's positive is gonna bias the estimate up and a deviation W that's negative is gonna bias the estimate down. And so shrinking, which is essentially taking care of those two cases um, is gonna reduce both types of error um, and this is the formula that's going to turn out to be equivalent uh, to the result that I showed you in the beginning for principal component analysis. So this here um, is shrinkage towards the grand mean, where we're going to take our observe observation eta, we're going to compute the mean of all of its entries, 
and we're going to shrink towards that target. So this is a little bit of abuse of notation. You can just kind of picture this to be a vector with every single entry equal to the average of the ADAs, um, and then a vector plus a vector type of um, um, calculation um, here. So how do I relate this back to, to principal component analysis? Why are they one and the same thing? Um, here is the, the going to be the starting point of the, the answer. So this is, we're back again in the uh, PCA setting where we start with a sample covariance matrix and I'm going to decompose it into, um, into the first sample principal component H and the largest eigenvalue S squared and then some remainder. Um, so this term is just everything else that's left over once you extract the first principal direction. So the relationship that we're looking for is how do we relate the principal component H to the equation that I showed you earlier, which looks at the observation as the sum of the signal plus a deviation away from it. So this is uh, exactly what's done in this paper referenced um, at the original slide. I'll show you also that the optimal C for shrinkage um, takes on exactly the same structure as uh, a James Stein estimator and also matches mathematically the, um, the, the same estimator that zeroed out the optimization bias of a minimum variance portfolio. So here is a quick recipe for um, how, you, um, how you assemble a James Stein estimator for the first principal PC. So there are going to be four steps. The first step is simple. You take your data and form a sample covariance matrix S, and we're going to extract uh, Q eigenvalues out of this. And uh, by Q, I'm actually going to mean one, but uh, in data that's, you know, that may not satisfy this assumption. So we're actually going to be looking for um, extracting as many eigenvalues before there's an eigenvalue gap. So in other words, you extract Q of the largest, and after the, the Q principal component, there should be a big drop off. Um, once you have that, we're going to focus in on the leading principal component, this H, with the largest eigenvalue S. And we're going to take the eigenvector, which is normalized to have unit length one, and scale it by the variance, scale it by the square root of the eigenvalue. And then we're going to compute the mean of the entries and their sample variance. That's step two. Step three is going to follow at least the intuition of the James Stein estimator. We're going to first characterize what we mean by noise, which is what goes in the numerator of this formula here. And you can see the, the intuition behind this. So what is this doing? This is looking at the variance in your data and subtracting the variance of all of the top Q eigenvalues, which has the interpretation of the signal. So what remains is just noise. And you're then taking dividing by P and N to average it out. And so this new hat here is an estimate of the noise in your data. You're going to define, divide this by the same uh, sample variance of the observation that's used in the James Stein formula. And then the final step is to return HJS, which is the corrected principal component, uh, the corrected sample principal component. So you can see the numerator contains James Stein shrinkage and the denominator in the square root of P, all that's doing is just normalizing the result to get a unit length vector, which is how we think of principal components as variance directions. Uh, here's a quick illustration. Um, uh, so this uh, is looking at you know, the, it's an, an experiment of, of how efficient um, uh, JS is or James Stein is for PCA. This is a graphic that's going to compare, number one, the, the James Stein principal component in terms of the angle to the population 
uh, principal component. So on this axis, you have the angle away from the true principal component. You can see that the JS1 lands you somewhere between uh, 10 and 15. The raw PCA vector, that's H, is going to land us somewhere between 25 and 30 degrees away from the principal component. And both of these were computed with exactly 50 observations. And I'm going to try to remember the P value. Uh, P, the number of variables or the number of securities, thinking about the financial application is 500 here. And now what you could do is you could take your, your original PCA procedure and see how many samples do you need to catch up with, with JS, with James Stein. So you can see that in this example, and you know, it depends a little bit on the configuration of the model, we've doubled our sample and still not reduced the angle to the sufficient amount. So this is a simple Gaussian model. Um, and you can see the benefits of, of, uh, of doing this shrinkage formula. Um, here is a quick uh, summary of um, you know, how to establish the result. Um, there are a lot of uh, details, but this is the fundamental relationship to, to kind of set up. Um, what we're trying to do is relate the sample principle component or the scaled one. So in other words, you know, what I need to do is um, somehow write down everything in this formalism. So I need to write my observation eta in terms of the signal plus some distortion vector. Um, and I need to do it for PCA. And this is the recipe. We're going to take sample principal component H multiplied by the square root of the eigenvalue. Uh, this is going to be the, or at least beta divided by its length is going to be the population principal component. Uh, this W is going to be a um, whole collection of terms and a complicated perturbation error. But the summary is that we've achieved the goal, the goal was to get this decomposition in the setting of PCA. And then the rest is um, uh, matrix perturbation theorems. Those are the ones that are helpful in, in getting the rest of the results. And the results are as follows. So I have a couple of theorems in uh, this paper in, in particular. Uh, it came out at the end of uh, last year. Um, what we're looking at is the efficiency of the James Stein estimator for the first principal component uh, in different under different um, conceptions of error. So one of them is going to be mean squared error, where we're just looking at the difference squared between the entries. So here, the result says, uh, and this is all in the limit. So this infinity refers to the fact that I took my dimension to, to infinity, like we've been doing the whole time. Uh, mean squared error of the James Stein estimator of the first PC is that of the raw PC times this parameter C infinity, uh, which is defined in terms of the signal ratio inherent signal to noise ratio in the system. So I'm not going to get into the definitions of this because they're uh, a little bit complicated, um, but hopefully it gives you a little bit of intuition for, for what this is. Um, this is going to be a ratio of um, well, uh, the spike corresponds to the signal, the rest corresponds to the error, hence signal to noise ratio. Um, and this parameter C, you can see that it's between zero uh, and one. So that's theorem one, uh, looking at mean squared error estimation for James Stein estimation of the first PC. The second one looks at angle. So this quantity here, SPH refers to spherical. Um, and this is roughly the angle squared between the sample population, the sample and the population components. And you get a similar type of result, the angle between the James Stein uh, sample component and the population one um, is proportional to the raw sample component and the population one times a parameter D, which is in this interval. Um, and so again, I'll direct you to this reference for all of the quantities involved, but D under most kind of, um, you know, under most settings uh, is going to be somewhere below one um, and ab above C, reducing the angle. Uh, here's a quick illustration. So this is 
similar geometry to what I showed you in the beginning uh, of the talk, uh, where we were on the unit sphere. This is showing the same scenario uh, in the plane. So this <clears throat> is a James Stein estimator in a low dimension. So in a low dimension, we may not expect things to work. And hence, I've illustrated this case. Uh, this is the mean squared error distance to the unknown, the thing we're trying to estimate. And in a low dimension, it just may be that your shrinkage target is not optimally positioned and you're actually moving away from the unknown. Once the dimension is high enough and the results were all asymptotic in, in nature and the, sort of that there's no clear guideline on how to pick the dimension large enough, but once it is large enough, we are gonna settle into a picture that looks roughly like this, where um, the, J, the James Stein estimator is closer to the unknown and it's lying on this chord close to a theoretically optimal value, which is achieved in the sort of limit as P goes to infinity. So this is sort of the um, theoretically ideal uh, James Stein estimator of the first PC uh, once the dimension is taken to, uh, to infinity. And this recipe, um, I haven't mentioned the specific connection, but if you just take, take the recipe and compare the two, uh, you'll see that they're one and the same. Um, so I realize I'm over time a little bit, but I think I'm basically uh, right there. Uh, I'll quickly summarize. Uh, uh, hi, I don't know if people hear that, um, but uh, let me keep going. I'll mention a few thoughts about ongoing work um, and then I'll open up for questions. This will take just uh, five minutes or so just to kind of go through um, a few of the things that are still sort of on the research agenda. So one is connections to quadratic programming. Um, I've discussed um, the, this um, fully invested constraint. Um, so this fully invested constraint is what coincidentally um, relates to the same target as used in the James Stein estimator, namely the vector of all one. So it's pure coincidence that the minimum variance portfolio is actually fixed by the James Stein estimator. If you take that, um, that constraint of the quadratic optimization program and change it to a different vector, uh, you, you're not going to be, uh, you're not going to be tuning your estimator for the minimum variance portfolio. Okay, and in fact, your target should be whatever the constraint is. So this is kind of a quick, uh, uh, quick view into what the, the connection to quadratic, quadratic programming is. Your shrinkage target is related to the constraints of your quadratic program. Uh, it seems possible that we could treat the sample correlation matrix, which is widely uh, used in a lot of settings. Uh, this does generate a lot of dependence structure, so that it looks like it's going to follow maybe under some very strong assumptions, but this would be of a lot of theoretical interest to see if we can extend these results to the sample covariance matrix. Um, there's some interesting work coming out on what we're calling uh, direction penalized PCA. So this is a way of extracting a sample uh, component while penalizing for a direction. Um, so here, hope I shouldn't be minimizing this. This should be maximizing. Right? So I'm looking for the maximum direction of variance in the data subject to a penalty where I'm biasing towards some specific direction. And you can actually recover uh, the James Stein estimator under certain conditions in this way. And there are some nice connections to uh, the wild wolf shrinkage estimators um, also. Uh, and then these are just a collection of loose uh, thoughts uh, related to central limit style results, which seem to be possible in some settings. Um, we're working on one here, which uh, is possible in the setting of n equals two. So n equals two is the only case where we can treat, where we can get CLT type results that show how the James Stein estimator converges. Um, it seems possible to extend all of this to multi-factor models. Uh, I mentioned a recipe that works with multiple spikes, but that's a little bit more sort of uh, intuition and not theoretically proved. And, um, it's, uh, it seems to be possible to extend this to multiple spikes, what are called multi-factor models. Um, I mentioned this result of multi-anchor shrinkage, the MAPS estimator, um, which uses domain knowledge to get consistent estimators. 
uh, this is actually quite a striking result given that um, you wouldn't expect a consistent estimator with a finite number of samples. Um, and then um, all sorts of ideas, let's see what I mean here by concentration of measure on the optimization bias. So uh, there is a connection to, um, to how measure concentrates on the unit sphere and what, uh, you know, what that, um, uh, what that means for how we correct uh, uh, these random vectors. And then finally, um, this is not really um, something that's been explored, but essentially empirical, you know, employing this in, in empirical data, uh, data sets outside of finance, um, or even for finance, that's not something that we've been able to, uh, to do very much of. So I'll, I'll pause here. I think this is my last uh, slide. Yep, that's the one. Um, so I'll pause here and I'll, I'll take any questions that, that you have. Uh, sorry for running a little late. Well, no worries. Uh, Elfine is the great name for the last slide, I have to yeah. say. Yeah. Uh, anyone have any questions for, uh, for Alex? Empirically, how good are the forecasts of data? So you look at, you look at your computed betas, your computer covariance matrix. Um, how well do they form out of sound? Let me try to, um, maybe you can clarify the question a little bit because it's, um, can we try to make it a bit more more precise? Forecast for, for what? You, you compute, a, so you compute a minimum variance portfolio. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. um, then you roll it forward. Mm -hmm. um, how does it compare empirically to other techniques or to the true minimum variance portfolio in the next period? Oh, next period. Um, so, what I will direct you to is just um, a sampling of numerical results that I showed. Uh, let me go back to here. There are others in the paper that you could look at. Um, so, yeah, you know, so what does this picture address? It addresses um, essentially the behavior of this ratio. So, V squared, which was my true risk of my minimum variance portfolio, divided by V hat, which was the estimated risk. And this was the quantity that you can see it here. First of all, the asymptotic that was relevant there is this one. And so, you know, that's exactly what you see in this picture is that this ratio explodes. So if you're asking for the performance for this particular correction, which is tuned to just that one portfolio, um, this is what you'll see. In other words, you will not see uh, a gap. What you will see is this ratio, and this will be crossed off. And what you'll see is a bounded ratio between what you, you think the risk is and what you're estimating the risk. Sorry, sorry what, you, um, what the actual mm -hmm. risk is. No, and it might be worth just taking the stocks in the S&P 500 Yep. Uh, computing, in a, uh, say once a month, you compute an empirical covariance matrix, you compute what you think the minimum variance portfolio is, uh, run it for a month, compute its return, do the same uh, going, f uh, going forward, rolling this forward, and say, what was the variance of that minimum variance portfolio? You could, maybe you could uh, compute the true minimum variance portfolio with foresight, with perfect foresight. Uh, so how did it compare? How did you compare, uh, you know, relative to that? Yeah, so, right. So, so we don't have any work on empirical uh, data uh, at this point. So that, that's certainly a very, very valid direction. I mentioned it sort of at the end of the slide, but um, I don't have um, any sort of... Uh, uh, I don't have any uh, results that are empirical in nature to, to present to you and say, this is what you should use. So, you know, the, the not that, that, that's the asset test, right? That's right. A, uh, right. This is simulation, right? So this is in, yeah. in simulation where you you know, the true covariance, but with, with an empirical framework, you have to set up something else, What you're suggesting seems reasonable. Um, now, uh, Alex. Yep. Mm -hmm. Hi, it's Lisa. Uh, uh, thank you, to Thomas, if I may, for yeah. the question. We have two studies like that in progress. Okay. So I think that's a great question. And uh, 
metric you propose is exactly the one we're working with, but we don't have results at this second. Okay. But if it, and as many, of, of course, it could be in a lot of different contexts. We could do S and P five hundred, and we could yeah. do MSCI World. I mean, we could yeah. do uh, this period or that period. And uh, yeah. it, it, following on Alex's uh, invitation, and anyone who's interested in doing empirical work with these measures, I'm, I'm very, very interested in following along or supporting or. Um, and we're, we're, we're working on it. Uh, All right, this is, uh, I think it's, uh, it's great the excitement you've generated. And I think that the fact that people are asking for empirical work, um, I think it really means that, uh, at least I felt this was a very elegantly presented statistical argument. It'd be great to bring this more into uh, the finance world. And, and I, I know we could appreciate it in this, in this audience very much. Yeah, for sure. So thank you very much for your, your attendance. I'm going to have to cut it off here, but, uh, but uh, let's, uh, Give him a virtual round of applause. I don't know what we can do here uh, for for a great presentation, and we hope to uh, we hope to see you again soon. Yeah, great. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. I, I hear I hear the applause. Thank you. <laughs> it's like it's like the sound of one hand clapping is what right. it is. Yep. All right, great. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you. Cheers. Thank you, Dave. Have a good day. Thank you again, Alex. Yep, thanks a lot. Take care. Bye. Have a good evening. Mm -hmm.